Okay, so first of all, the way that the normalized scale gradient script works is this is part of image integration, or at least this calculation is built into image integration, but we're going to be doing it through this script. So we need what is normally input for image integration is what we need here. We need calibrated images that are already registered. So that is the point of your processing workflow that you're going to be using this script. And that's what I'm going to show you here in a moment are registered, calibrated and registered data. Let me show you some images. So I have some images on an object. It's not a very spectacular field or anything like that. Uh, but in some sense that actually kind of helps because then there's no confusion with anything else that might be going on in the frame. Here is a very wide field image of a very faint nebula. Uh, this is uh, Abel 35 is what it is. I'm going to display these images in exactly the same way so that we can blink them. Um, and as I say, a very wide field image. You can see the, the nebula there in the middle. You can see that this, this is calibrated. Uh, but you can see my images are not perfectly calibrated, and as you'll see as I blink through them, they are imperfect in a number of ways. Oftentimes people think that, you know, all the data that Adam Block uses, it must be perfect. Far from the truth. Absolutely not true. In fact, that's true just in general, by the way. Even in professional observatories, rarely do you have spectacular data. Here is a great example of that. What you'll notice is that some of the data, either because of uh, looking very low in the sky. This object is low in the sky, and the lower you look, the worse the quality is. Or it could be some thin clouds. N notice how you get a gradient uh, going across this frame here. In fact, if I just blink through the frames, you'll just see this variation in the image quality from frame to frame. Some look quite good, but otherwise they're, they're all kind of different here. And these differences affect, when we combine everything together, that final uh, waiting in that final outcome that we're looking to try to do in image integration. So um, what we want to have happen is we want to measure these images and determine what the differences are so that we can normalize them and do pixel rejection better and in some sense also as I'll demonstrate uh, simplify some of the gradients that we do see here. As I mentioned in the previous section, the import, it's not critical that we find the very best frame, but it makes things very sensible when you do so. So we need to find a reference frame that we're going to adjust all other frames to as part of the normalization process. So as I flip through the images here, I mean, which images kind of look uh, best? Th um, let's see, this image, this, yeah, something like this looks fine. This has a simple gradient. The contrast of the nebula is quite good. Um, and otherwise, you know, compared to some of these other images, this would be a fine frame potentially to think of as our reference frame. So I'm going to note this frame. It's, uh, you can see by my file name. I'm just going to write it down somewhere. This is what you'll want to do. April 2nd on, it's number two, I guess. That's the frame that's going to be my reference frame. Now, normalizing images means that we're doing this for a particular set of data that's, in my case, these are filtered data, right? If you just have a, a one-shot color camera, it's just one set of data, but I have three colors. I have red, a set of red data, a set of green data, a set of blue data. So I need to find three different references um, for each of these sets of data. So you don't just choose one reference of red and somehow do this in the other colors. So it needs to be for one color you do this process that I'm doing, and then you do it again for the other colors. Um, it's easy, though. You just blink through, find a good reference frame. One of the things you'll see in a moment is if you want to do it blindly, you can assume that images that are highest in the sky are probably best, and just go by altitude if that's information that you know in the FITS header. So we have now picked a reference frame. I am for the moment going to close these and let's run the script. You can finally see what this thing does. So we're going to add the files that we want to normalize. We add them all here. That's step one. Step two, the next button, is to set a reference frame. Uh, but the way that this uh, works is that, hold on, I have to find this. So you can organize this by altitude, my FITS headers. Uh, in my files, they do show me the altitude. You can see this object is never very high in the sky. 
or you can organize by file name, which is going to help me because now I can find which file I want, which is the April 2nd, number two. So that's what I'm going to set as my reference. And what you'll see here is the way that normalized scale gradient works is that it needs to actually measure stars. And by doing so, it needs to know, in order to make little apertures and other uh, metrics, it needs to know something about your plate scale. And uh, that means that it needs to know the focal length or the pixel scale or the pixel size. It needs to know two out of three of these numbers to figure it out. So it so happens some of my numbers are already in my fit setter. Whatever information it doesn't have, you're going to need to give it. And, and so this is the correct focal length, 500 millimeters for my particular system. That's all you need to do. You need to do that once and then it'll remember or you can just put in the same numbers each time. What it's doing now is it just analyzed my reference frame, the frame that I picked. And now we can do a couple of things. We can compare the reference to other frames, um, which is what some of these other buttons are going to allow us to do. You'll notice the reference frame here is highlighted in green. That's just to remind us which frame it is, in case you forget. It's also here, but it's just nice to see it in the list. And if I did that, is that frame actually the highest in the sky? Not really. Uh, the frame I picked is not really the highest in the sky, but it was just kind of better. The difference between the highest and the lowest, though, is not, it's only like five degrees, so not a big difference here. Okay, I'm just going to indicate how the script works, but I want to spell something out here. Everything I'm about to show you, mostly the defaults do their job. Now, what I explain at Atom Block Studios in all of my um, tutorials is I explain in detail what these options are, how to make them work, and so on. I'm obviously not going to do that in detail here in this YouTube video. That's a much more extensive explanation, but I can at least hint at um, how much of this works. But I just want to say from the beginning that many of these things are pretty much optimized to give you uh, a fairly good result, and you can tell if they're not, uh, which is also quite useful. So star detection, I'm just going to show, oh, I have to click on another image. So I click on another image and that's going to compare to the reference. We can look at the stars that are being detected. This is using the same kind of logic and algorithm that um, is used elsewhere in PixInsight just to detect stars based on these uh, structure at a particular scale. So that works just as you might expect. It just needs to do that in order to do its job. There is also this bit here, close that, where there's this photometry and we can look at the actual stars that are being measured in the image. And this is what's actually doing the job of measuring the brightnesses of stars. You'll see that, you know, we're getting stars that are, uh, this by the way is not a high quality frame I just clicked on apparently, it looks kind of terrible. Let's see if the reference frame looks a little, yeah, the reference frame looks a little better. That cycles between the two. Uh, but you can see that stars are being measured and this is uh, common for what is called photometry where you measure the flux of the star and then you have to subtract the local background to give you basically the light of a star and we're going to be looking at the characteristics of the ensemble of all the stars in the image to give us a metric of what is the scaling factor. If you recall in the previous section, we need to know that number. This is going to calculate the scaling factor actually first so that it can do the next part, which is actually the clever part of uh, figuring out what that offset is, especially when there are gradients. But it's the calculation of the scaling factor that is done here. In fact, in the next graph, you can see the photometry graph that this is going to give us a relationship between stars that are in our reference frame and stars that are in any of the target frames. And it's going to calculate right here, you can see in the console, it's going to calculate a scaling factor. You can adjust the number of stars that it's looking at here. You can try to remove any um, outliers. Again, this is the non-auto stuff. I'm suggesting that auto does a very good job, but I explain in my tutorials what the meaning of removing these outliers are. You'll find that it has a negligible, in this case, effect on the scaling factor that's calculated, which is why I'm suggesting that the auto can do a fine job. And then finally, there's the last part 
which is that it's going to look at, once it knows the scaling factor, we're going to look at regions of the image and not include the stars in the calculation, but instead calculate the flux or the brightness of each of these little squares here. You'll see that not all um, it's not completely covered by squares because what you're going to do is ignore any contribution from perhaps scattered light from the bright stars. Uh, so if a little region should intersect with one of these little zones of avoidance around bright stars, then that region is not uh, looked at for this calculation of what will effectively be the gradient across the chip. And so this is a measurement uh, showing us how the uh, the light is going to vary across the image and that is what is matched to the reference frame and that's a critical idea you remember from the uh, the uh, previous section where I showed how you're going to add or subtract a number to get that offset well now we're doing adding or subtracting a number per region which is going to basically be matching the gradient that we have in our reference frame. So that's an important concept to keep in mind when you look at your reference image. If this script does its job, it's going to match whatever gradient we see in that reference image. Uh, all the target images will match that. That is the correct answer. That's the answer that we're looking for. And if that frame as I have has a simple gradient, then it's easy to take care of subsequently. When you have combined the images, then you do a DBE on it and you remove a simple gradient rather than combining many complex gradients together and making that job much more difficult. Another very important thing to keep in mind is that this is different than local normalization, which has its own vagaries. And I'm going to argue that uh, many more artifacts, this process here in normalized scale gradient, doesn't really introduce artifacts and you can see if it is doing so by looking at some of the feedback of these graphs and I'll show you one in just a moment. But the way in which this is different than say local, uh, local normalization is that you do not on your reference frame you don't really want to touch it in terms of you don't want to try to apply DBE to that frame or anything like that. We really want that reference frame to serve as our un edited, if you will, gold standard. Now there is a small adjustment that you can make, but it's a technicality. Um, here we want that reference frame not to be processed in any other way um, so that we can make a comparison across all the frames and then we get these good results. So having shown you that we're looking at these regions of the image, the final part is that there is this gradient correction, which I'm going to say is the matching uh, between the target frame and any reference frame. So let's look at the plot of what that looks like. And this is um, something that you can, of all the things that I've shown so far, this is the one where you want to maybe make an adjustment to make sure that there's a good fit. So this is um, based on those regions, this is the gradient that's being measured and it needs to, the program, the script needs to fit that gradient uh, with some kind of reasonable um, line here. And if we're following that line well, if we're following our, our points, our measured points in the image, then we're going to get a good result. If instead we see variations from that, then uh, perhaps we need to make some adjustments. So what I'll just demonstrate here is that this is a particular horizontal line running right through the center of my frame. Uh, my chip has 3056 pixels by 3056. So a value here of 1528, y equals 1528, that means any x value, that is the horizontal line that divides this image in half. And this is the grading, what it looks like in brightness as you go across the frame in pixel a coordinate here, in x coordinate. Here's the brightness in the vertical sense. Uh, it's a good fit, but I can change the line, right? I'll change what we're looking at. So this would be somewhere near the top of the image. It's still a good fit. Or we can go near the bottom of the image. It's still a good fit, though. You can see a deviation down here, right? That's okay. You can have small deviations from the perfect fit. That's all right, as long as we're minimizing them. But if you want to try to make this line fit, you know, all instances throughout the image, you can do so by moderating or adjusting this 
gradient smoothness. This is what adjusts the spline fitting of um, these gradients in the image. And uh, so if I make this a smaller number, it tries to fit better. And it's recalculating here is what it's doing. It takes it a second to do it. See how it bent down? So it's trying to fit better this result. But going to some very, very small number isn't necessarily going to help because then you're really trying to torque and tweak that spline fitting to, you know, to do every little bend and wiggle. And that can potentially produce some artifacts that are not actually represented in a gradient that's not represented in your data. So be careful about going too far. I'm going to do a nice compromise here. I'll just say one just so I can have shown you that I made an adjustment with this particular setting. That's it. That is the only thing that I adjusted um, this time around. There is another nice feature to this, which is in a moment, as you recall, this script does the job of something that is already in image integration. So we need to load the files in image integration. We're going to get output files here, and then we're going to um, use image integration to combine them together. The cool thing is that the script will um, automatically load um, image integration for us. And in just a moment, I'm going to show you what that looks like because there is a, a particular set of settings that you need to do. And this will automatically load it for us with the proper settings. There is one more thing that you don't need to do, uh, but it's useful, especially when understanding how to use this. I'm going to output some of those gradient files so that you can see that the calculation of the gradient based on those target images relative to the reference frame looks about right. So I'm going to have it output not only our adjusted frames, but also these gradient little files, small files, uh, that we can look at as well. I do need to spell out where it's going to save the data. And I'm going to go ahead and put it right in the same place, and that's not it. Let me put it in the same place that I grabbed those files from, which is here, my registered red file data. So I'm going to have different files that, in addition to the original ones in there. And uh, I'm going to tell it to go. I'm, I'm going to think for a moment. This is going to add NSG to all the, the file names. And it's also going to write, and this is important to know, it's going to write the, the weight that it calculates based on the scaling factor, the, the calculation anyway of that total weight with the scaling factor and the noise contribution. It's going to save in the FITS header as this term and weight, and we're going to use that in image integration. So I'm going to press go, and it'll start to do the process. One of the things that uh, is nice about the script, because this does take some time, is that as it does these calculations, it's going to give us an estimate based on the amount of time it you know, took to do a few frames here. It'll tell us how long it's going to take to do the rest of them, assuming that the computer uh, operates at the same speed throughout. This is going to take me five minutes to do these, I don't know how many frames that was, 30 frames or something like that. So you can see it takes 11 seconds or something per frame. So it must be more than that. But yeah, 32 frames. There we go. Um, I'll be back in obviously five minutes.